Today we come together to memorialize John Thomas Powers. I was very fond of John, and I'll never forget the, the first time I met him. Teresa and I had not officially started at Light of Christ yet, but we were, I was supposed to preach my first sermon the following Sunday. And so we're driving around looking at houses, and we realized that it would be a good idea to find some place to take a bathroom break. And we were coming pretty close to the church, and I had been given the key, to, uh, the code to, to get in the door, so we stopped here. I noticed an old red pickup parked in the back, but we came in the front door, and Bill heard the door open, and he came walking down the hall asking if he could help me. And instead of introducing myself, I, my little quirky sense of humor, I went, no, I'm fine, thank you very much for asking. He looked puzzled and turned around and walked and got his dad. His dad came down and he introduced himself. And then I introduced myself and all things became clear. It was the first time that I had been greeted as father in a very distinct New England accent. I assured him he could call me Mike, but he let me know that he could never do that. He had grown up Catholic and to address a priest by his first name was just not done. So now he knew who I was, but it still wasn't clear to me who he was. I had been told that a retired army general often cooked meals at the church for anyone who wanted to come and eat. And I was looking forward to meeting this man because I have a real, heart, a real soft spot in my heart for the poor and I have a real soft spot for food, clearly. <laughs> the man who stood before me with a scruffy gray beard and baggy khaki pants and a red, dirty red baseball hat did not fit into my preconceived notion of what a general would look like, retired or not. We spent a few minutes chatting and I asked him if he was retired, assuming that he was, and what he had done for a living. And he told me he had spent 39 and a half years in the army. Well, I'm thinking this guy's probably a retired, maybe a sergeant major or something like that. And so I asked him, he told me he retired as a brigadier general but that he had enlisted as a private. Then he told me the long and circuitous route of how he got there and told the story as only John could. And they were preparing a meal for the next day, Wednesday, for anyone who wanted to stop by. And this wasn't peanut butter or cheese sandwiches. This was homemade soup and ribs. That's the kind of things that John fixed. I was amazed. And that began our, our relationship that was sometimes so warm and inviting and sometimes was so tense. <laughs> and I always knew when John wasn't happy with me because he would stop calling me father. <laughs> and he would just grunt. I don't think generals like being told no very much by non-coms. And John wasn't any different. But we had many long discussions about his faith journey and the heartbreaks that he had encountered along the way. We talked of regrets, we talked of joy, but mostly we talked about the healing power to be found in Jesus Christ. And whenever John started talking about how Jesus had changed his life and how the Holy Spirit had brought him peace, his face would change and that peace would enter the room. There were times when he got so fired up about something and, and that profound passion of his could easily go in the other direction as well. He was maybe one of the most complex individuals that I have encountered. And yet he had the biggest heart of anybody that I've ever met. He cared about those who were down and out. He'd do anything he could to help them. I think that's why he fell in love with the Kairos ministry and looked forward to twice a year going to Buckingham Prison for the Kairos weekends. And it was there 
that he first found out what it was to be a Christ follower. And he said he found that through Walt T. Strake. I hope you know he considered you his spiritual father. The Kairos team always took chocolate chip cookies to the prison. I'm talking about lots and lots of cookies. Diabetic coma amount of cookies. <laughs> And John would usually himself bake 70 to 75 dozen cookies here at the church. It would reek of chocolate chip cookies for days. And I would gain weight from the fumes. <laughs> I also had several quiet and touching moments with John the last few weeks of his life. Neither of us knew how quickly things were going to progress. But we did talk about the comfort of knowing and being loved by the God who had created us and had offered eternal life in the presence, his presence through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I loved our epistle reading from this morning from 1 John 3, 1 to 3. See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that what, when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. The Apostle John could write about this, this love and this assurance and this future blessed hope because he had been with Jesus when he had spoke the promise of our gospel message this morning from John chapter 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Our separation from loved ones who have died in the faith is temporary, providing that we too have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We shall see them again, and there be no more pain, no more suffering, no more fear, no more sorrow forever. The sobering fact before us today is that every one of us will one day be the one being mourned at a service like this. And whether it will be a celebration of life now continued eternally in the presence of God or a tragedy of a, a life now lived in eternal judgment depends solely on whether or not you have encountered and accepted Jesus Christ. Sin and judgment is not a popular topic in our culture. And those who dare brook the subject are seen as unloving or narrow-minded bigots. But the truth is, to not warn of sin and judgment before a holy God is the most unloving thing I can think of. Because this, the scripture is very clear. That it's, a, it's a matter of eternal life or eternal damnation. We live in a time where many people who have rejected, have rejected God and they have no idea of a loving creator. And because of that, they have no sense of hope or the truth and the meaning of the love of Christ revealed through the cross. Many are seeking to find out the meaning of life and have concluded that life has no real hope or meaning. If you're a Christian, then you must reveal that news to them of the loving, saving power of Jesus Christ. And when you introduce that person to Jesus, he provides that person with their true identity, the true reason why they were created, which is to know God and to worship and enjoy him forever. The fact is that through God, Christ offers relationship with him here and now. 
And that's what we're created for. And the more we run away from God, the more we suffer the consequences of our sin. It leads to misery. It leads to addictions. It leads and causes us to pursue things that do not bring satisfaction. Only Jesus is able to meet the need of our hearts. And we can only have Jesus if we're willing to bow our wills to him in repentance and faith and turn to him. John Powers knew this, and this is how he dealt with pain and suffering. John Powers did not want to die. John loved life. He loved the life that God had given him. He loved the life he had with Bill and with Kairos and with us at Light of Christ. And all the possibilities that he could dream of, of reaching out to those around him. He loved doing that as much as anything else. Teresa and I were with him on the Sunday afternoon before he passed away. We had no idea that he would leave us on Thursday. But we could see that his time had grown shorter than previously had been assumed. And we had a frank discussion about the reality that he was actually going to die soon. And he, can't, he confessed that he wasn't really ready to go, but that he knew where he was going because of Jesus Christ. And we knew it too. And we were able to leave that room that day knowing it was likely we would never see him again. The next time I saw him was on Wednesday at the VA hospital. And I sat with him that morning and held his hand. And we prayed together. He was in and out. I read scriptures to him until he went to sleep. And I held his hand for another hour. And I left. He held on to my hand with a strong grip because he wanted to hold on to life. And that night, he went to be with his Lord. Today, we come to say goodbye for now to John Powers. He's gone on, but you and I are still here. Where will you spend eternity? Jesus is very clear. He is the only way to the Father. The only way to hope and salvation. There are no other options. And this morning, I am so glad to stand here, knowing where my brother John is. He's before the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. And I assure you, given the opportunity, he would not come back. Will you see him? Will you see him again? That depends. Will you surrender your life to Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us words of not just life, but words of comfort and words of what it means to be at peace with you. And I thank you so much that we can stand here this morning knowing that John Powers had made peace with you. Not just peace with you, but joy with you. He experienced your love and your presence, but only tasted and saw here. But now he's fully realized. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, we, it's a reminder to us to stay the course. And for those here this morning who do not know Jesus Christ, it is a reminder that someday you're going to meet him face to face as Savior or as judge, I ask this morning that you would open up our hearts and that we would follow the example of our brother. In Jesus' name, amen.